Got it. Got it. All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to this evening's lecture. I'm delighted to have Dr. Zoe Lochman um, here tonight um, to do something mad, it looks like. Um, artist and maker, mad scientist, um, TV celebrity, uh, <laughs> Dr. Zoe Lachlan. Uh, she's creator, creative director and curator of materials at the Institute of Making and the materials library there um, at UCL, which is just up the road. You should all go and check it out. Um, and their collection up there ranges, they have about thousands of materials, don't you know? Um, ranging from chocolate to uranium, birds' nests, baby teeth, um, aerogel, memory foam, anything. Um, and I think most of them are handleable, so it's, it's a working materials library, kind of a, quite an amazing thing. Um, and Zoe is, uh, is Dr. Zoe and her wonder stuff on ITV's uh, Good Morning, if you guys ever get up early enough. This morning, sorry. Um, and she's worked with the Tate and the Hayward and the Wellcome Trust um, and the v and as a, as a material consultant. Um, she conducts material experiments with some of the most ordinary and some of the most extraordinary materials um, and generally enthuses anyone in a kind of in the vicinity with, a, with an amazing infectious enthusiasm for, for the material world and the things around us, performing theatrical demonstrations, um, making instruments, and generally kind of um, being fun with materials. Um, so she, she does things that we might think of as science, uh, but actually comes from an art background, art and performance, um, which is, is a really interesting place to be, I think, to start to talk about materials and to have that kind of crossover between craft and science and art and um, performance, as I say. Um, and the Institute of Making is a really amazing place. Um, the first time I went there, it had a whole tree in it um, and people were cutting it up and machines were, it was kind of being devoured by craftsmen and machines and um, material scientists and students and it got kind of eaten. Um, which is, um, it's, it's a place that's playful, it's a place that's kind of vibrant and uh, a, f a fun place to be, I found. Um, so she's not a hands-off material enthusiast, as you can probably tell from the table. Um, she actually once told me that she ate somebody's work at an art gallery opening uh, because she thought it was the buffet. Um, <laughs> I think it turned out to be someone's armpit. Um, or toe, toe cheese or something? But um, she, I'm sure she styled it out as a materials experiment. Yeah. Um, definitely. Okay, so on that note, um, delighted to welcome Dr. Zoe Lachlan. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, anybody sat at the back at any point, if you feel you need to come closer, you can, because I can see there's quite a lot of latecomers. And yeah, exactly. Let's got your name on it. Feel free to come closer, because it will be better. Right, so thanks, Kate. That's quite a lot to live up to. But I'm going to spend the next hour showing you some of my favourite things. Actually, I should just let them get into the front. <laughs> and talking a bit about materials, the kind of art, craft, design, technology of stuff. But to begin with, there's a test. So, essentially, if you say, what are materials? Actually, it comes down to a sort of practice of use. They're the stuff that you use to make other things somehow. They're the kind of the building blocks of objects or they're these kind of notions of somehow this notion of a raw thing that gets transformed in something else. But actually materials are always in process. They're always getting up to things and they always have a relationship to tools and processes. And that constitutes for me making. So the Institute of Making is really founded on this idea that it's about materials and processes being inextricably linked. But if you were to ask a material scientist, or perhaps a physicist, an engineer, what are materials, they'd probably start by pointing you in the direction of the periodic table. Because these are those fundamental building blocks of everything. Here are the 92 elements that constitute our material environment and the world around us. 
and how they combine makes everything. I mean, this is it. But these actually are concepts. This is an idea of the state of matter. This is a map of the material world. But actually, when you get stuff, it isn't so straightforward as that. So copper, for example, element 29 up there. Copper occurs in the ground as this stuff. This is malachite. So to get it and make something like a copper spoon, actually there's a process of making, which is the mining and extraction of this, and then the smelting of it down, the taking away of the oxygen to get something that you then go, oh yeah, that's coppery, that's kind of copper-like. But actually copper isn't so straightforward. You get lots of different types, and I guess what I'm trying to say is this is it's more complex than this. But this is the kind of what sits at the heart of the kind of material science point of view of the world. But the other really important notion is that of scale. So that the idea that materials and their internal and external structures are the sort of defining factors of what they are like. So culturally, we're really used to this notion of scale in the kind of animate world, <laughs> that you'd have like a little mouse and you could zoom in in order of magnitude and there'd be a little flea on the back of that mouse. You could zoom in again and you might find like a hair on the back of the flea on the back of the mouse. You go inside, you get structures and like organs, then tissues made up of cells, and then you go inside the cell and you find other structures all the way down to like DNA and then made up of individual atoms. Now this has no bottom or top, this scale. You can keep going down or you can keep going up. But it's the idea that there are things there that we don't see, but they're code. So that internal structure actually provides code for the macro world. That DNA, that's a code that tells my body when you're going to grow hair, like grow kind of like coarse, thick, dark hair or maybe now grey hair. So, that, but that's the code in my DNA that's affecting a macro structure. Um, but you're, so for example, just to give you a sense of scale, I'm going to use a microscope later, but, um, you know, if you were to meet me, hopefully you wouldn't think that woman has a moustache. But, um, we'll start with some hair. You know, if we look under the microscope, I might, well, find some moustache. Yeah, look. and moustache. And that's that sense of scale. At what, certain scales, certain structures are revealed that you didn't see at other scales. So, back to the thing. And they can affect each other. So, equally, the DNA is giving an, instruct, an instruction on how to assemble itself up this way, but things can give instruction higher up. So, for example, I could be exposed, if I wanted to straighten my hair, I could mechanically straighten it, which would be up at the macro scale. But I could also chemically straighten it and sort of add molecules that attack the hair structure sort of halfway along the length scale and chemically straighten the hair. So you can change those properties by doing things at those different scales. And, but actually the same is true on the inanimate world. In the world of non-living materials, there are those structures inside that give specific properties. So for example, um, many of you are studying architecture, I assume, and have had some materials training, but it may be, um, raise your hand if I, if I say uh, all, crystal, all metals are crystalline. If that is news to you, you can, if you know it, put your hand up. If you know about metallic crystal structure, one, two. Okay, so it's not, even with people who have a materials training and have a practice that involves kind of intimate working with material and requiring materials to do things for you, like hold stuff up, actually some of these really fundamental internal structures aren't understood, so I'll, I'll unpack that. So all metals are made of crystals, and they're just so unimaginably small that we don't see them, we don't wander around and look at them. In fact, in culture we think of crystals being maybe like rock and gem shop hippie things, or maybe glass, which is not crystalline at all, or maybe water, you can imagine like snowflakes, they're kind of ice crystals. But all metals are made of crystals, and if I just go back to the microscope and show you um, the MacBook, so if I just put the microscope straight on the computer and just focus it again. Now that granular structure, that every single one of those tiny little dots is a metallic crystal inside the aluminium. That's just the surface grain of it. But I'm sure some of you still don't believe me. So the process of a metal going from liquid to solid is that of crystallization. What happens is you've got your liquid and little points in the liquid start to nucleate. That's just the name given to like the starting point of a crystal. So one crystal grows here, one crystal grows there, and then they touch each other and stop. And that crystal is then called a grain once it's in a solid structure. 
and that has a boundary, which is the grain boundary. And the size of, and orientation of these crystals give specific properties to metals. So if you want ductility, so that's like bendiness to you and me, if you want something to bend, you want crystals that will slide over each other inside. If you want a strength, you, you don't want any movement, you want crystals that lock into each other. So to make something like steel, you'll get iron, you add carbon, and what's happening is those little carbon uh, atoms are lodging between the, crisp, the gaps in the crystals, so they don't slide over each other. So then you have a really stiff material that you could like build a girder from. But I have some examples here of some other metallic crystals. So here is a piece of aluminium that we've cooled incredibly slowly. So this means the crystals get a chance to grow big, so big that you'll be able to see them with the naked eye. If you pass that round, you'll see on that surface that granular structure. But you'll also see some of the crystals have started to align themselves in a certain way because it's been extruded. But if you think like with wood, that's a kind of grain and a direction of strength and weakness. So when you extrude something, you change its internal structure, the orientation of that shape inside, and you then make either strong in certain directions, but also weak in others. I shall switch to this, because I've been looking forward to having a go on using this. So this is a piece of metal which is ductile. Can everyone see that? this screen all right? So here's a piece of metal, du ductile bendy. But this is made of a material called nitinol, so it's a nickel titanium alloy, sometimes referred to as a shape memory alloy. And this is a material that has a type of memory, and that's a direct response of what's happening is we've called it a memory, but actually it's just the performance of its crystal structure. So there's crystals inside this wire that, when they were born, like when they were first became crystals, they were all nice and straight and lined up next to each other. And I've bent it and sort of disorientated them, but it's more efficient for them to go back to their kind of birthplace, to where they were when they first became a crystal, but they need energy to do that. So that's where the blowtorch comes into place. So if I give this wire energy, it actually transforms and becomes a paperclip. Right, so what you've got there is both the performance of those crystals, and the, so the performance of this material, but actually suddenly you have a topology. You have a shape that you know now as paperclip, and you can start to think about the functionality of that object and how that's completely affected by the material. So the, I totally love paper clips because essentially it's just like, barely like a gesture. It's just like one, like a fart of a metal, just, just going like that. And then you have a thing that's just right. It can bend enough to open and get paper in, but it's still stiff enough. This, this wouldn't work, be a good paper clip. It's just not stiff. It's got enough stiffness of the steel paper clip to remain rigid to hold the paper, but it's bendy enough that you can get the paper in also, you know, soft enough that you can unpick it and do things with it. But um, I think it's a nice relationship between material, object, and functionality. Like, they're just inextricably linked. The function of that paperclip is due to the performance or nature of its material. I'll just do that again because I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Little paperclip. Good stuff. So, yeah, crystals, that's the crystals inside that paperclip transforming and changing. Another uh, example of wondrous nature of metallic crystals is this guy. So this is a single crystal jet turbine engine blade. Now we'll unpack that a bit. Basically as an object it gets cut here and that bit's the blade and you know if you see a plane and it's got the engine that's under the wing and there's really big blades at the front and they're there essentially to harvest oxygen. So when you're up in that in you know up in whatever thousand feet there's not a lot of oxygen up there. And the engine works by those spinning round, sucking in air, compressing it, moving it further back into the engine. Then you get rows and rows and rows and rows of these blades and making up these turbines, round and round like that. So that compressed air, then they inject fuel, they ignite it, and you have a massive explosion. And that, as an, a condition, as an environment, is incredibly high temperatures, really severe pressure. These guys are like wanging round at you know, thousand whatevers per minute, and it's a really extreme environment. The centrifugal force <coughs> is making this one a stretch. Any material that you can name, any metal you could name, just can't operate in that environment. Because what you have, if you were to have it made out of steel or something, you've got all those grains, all those grain boundaries, they are potential cracks. So what gives you good functionality in one thing, those potential cracks actually just mean the whole thing will explode. So they needed to, to build a jet engine, they needed a material that could 
withstand that environment. I'm going to burn. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just sort of very aware that suddenly this is being recorded forever. And I really needed to burp. I don't know why, sorry. And back in the room. Right, they can cut that bit out, can't we? <laughs> so, single crystal jet turbine engine blade that essentially then is made up of one ginormous metallic crystal. So you know how small they are because you just don't see them. And those, that one I passed around is like big ones. But this is just one fuck off massive metallic crystal. And how they do it is they grow it. It starts its life as a liquid in a mould and it's pressurised and cooled at this point here. And those crystals start to grow. Do you remember how I sort of described them earlier? A bit like ice crystals and Christmas tree arms. And those dendrite arms, they move up towards this helix. And then there's this great sort of game between the shape the crystal likes to grow and the shape it's being asked to grow through. And what happens is one like crystal gets its arm like above the others and almost sort of sperm and egg kind of way, but blocks the path, stops any other crystal from penetrating up here. And then that one arm solidifies this entire shape. So that means you can make one metallic crystal with no grain boundary, so no potential fault line. But we can fly, right, because of aerodynamics and lifts and wings and all that thing, but we can only fly fast because of jet engines. And so this is a kind of cultural artefact. This is how you can get to New York in eight hours. This is a kind of revolution of our society due to this material. So I think, I mean, next time you're in a plane, just like have a little look over and think to yourself, yeah, and then maybe say to your neighbour, it's all about crystals, and they'll think, oh my God, I'm just like some really mad, mad hippie or something. Um, so yeah, that's the metallic structure. I maybe I'll part this, pass this around because it's just such a kind of monumental, special thing that it's nice to hold. You'll notice it's got a strange kind of sticky coating on it. Um, try not to dig your nail in and peel it off, but um, that's designed to essentially clean the blade. So these are made by Rolls-Royce. So you, you could set up a factory in China tomorrow and make them, but no one would insure you. And in fact, EasyJet, they don't own those engines. They lease them from Rolls-Royce. And what comes with that lease is a service contract for those blades and a kind of guarantee of the relationship between the performance of the engine, its lifespan, and those blades. So Rolls-Royce make those. And you remember they had that whole, like, volcanic ash, Iceland, all, no planes flew because they had, a volcano had gone. But that was because all that dust, volcanic dust in the atmosphere, hit those blades and coated them in a glass, which isn't really a problem. And when you come down lower and the, um, the temperature warms up, the glass cracks off, and it's not a problem. But what the glass does is it takes with it that funny, strange coating. And that coating is needed as a natural cleaning of the natural dust that's in the atmosphere. But it took all the coating off in one go and essentially just invalidated the warranty of those blades. And Rolls Royce were like, it's supposed to fly this with that coating on, and now it's gone. So that's why that all happened. It was a kind of material thing. Um, so I'm going to just go back to a black screen so that I'm not sort of dazzled and talk more about some of the things on the table. Um, oh, actually, let me show you this because I've got a microphone. Another proof of metallic crystals for you. This is a piece of tin, which is actually one of my favourite materials because it's just so simple as an experience what I'm going to show you. But it's really transformative because it makes you suddenly have a physical experience of these metallic crystals. The crystals in tin are kind of like little hexagons. And the tips of them catch on each other when it bends. And that catching produces a vibration, which you can feel in your hands and you can hear. So I'm going to play you what's called the cry of tin. This is the official name. It's not me just making it up for poetry or something. But this is the cry of tin. So it's, I mean, crispy, crunchy, crackly. But it's just bendy like, I mean, it's bending, it's malleable. It feels like if I was to bend a spoon but it's crunching and crackling. And that is that tiny, microscopic, invisible, crystalline structure. And, but you can, I mean, sound tells you a lot about materials. It sounds granular. You know the type of nature of things that make those sounds, and those are things with little particles. And in fact, sound is a great way of finding out about the world around us and its materials. Like, you know, like, a, if you're a builder, like, oh, you've got dry rot, love. Like, there's acoustic signatures in our environment that are material specific. So one of the projects I did was all about sound and materials and made a whole range, like loads of tuning forks and instruments that use different materials for specific purposes. But I'll just pass a few rounds just to show you. 
uh, which are the best to pass around. I'm going to pass around copper and brass. The co I'll keep them as a pair so you can kind of compare between, your, you know, one ear and the other, whatever. The copper one is the one that's sort of pinker on the handle where people touch it. Um, but essentially, one is high and one is very low. And that's a direct response of the to do with the density and the elastic modulus of the stuff. So they're the same size, so it's just they're the same amount of material. So the pitch, the change in sound is directly attributable to the material from which it's made. Um, right, next. Does anyone want to pick something? I'm going to show you this because it's my current favourite. So this is a piece of self-healing concrete. This is a material which has a live, responsive system inside it. It essentially has bacteria impregnated into the material, but they're dormant. And those bacteria can remain dormant essentially indefinitely. They were kind of discovered in the volcanic environments. They have a very sort of stable longevity of just deadness, really. Like, you give them, wake them up, and then they get to work. But they'll stay in there for as long as you need. But the reason they wake up is if they get wet. And then if they get wet, you wake up, like all of us, you're a bit hungry. Thankfully, there's a food for that bacteria in here, and they start to eat that food and excrete out a material which heals the cracks in the concrete. So it's a process of bacteria poo, essentially, that fixes little hairline cracks in here. So it's at the scale of bacteria. I can't snap it in half and get it wet and it poo itself back together. This is to do with hairline cracks that form. But as you know, you've kind of got two options with cracks. One is catastrophe, earthquake, uh, the whole bit's fallen off, or just like a small crack, Oh, now. And the minute you spot that, that's already like seven years old, you know. It's a slow propagation, it's a slow creeping, little stresses and strains over time, just causing cracks to form, and then a crack spreading, maybe moisture gets in and it opens it up if it's outside. But this is designed to deal with that situation. Those bacteria are there to be woken up by any moisture that then hits them and then heal up those cracks in their surface. But um, it really sits in that sort of boundary between animate and inanimate. It's using animate systems to affect materials and to sort of make it a living dynamic system. Another version of that kind of animate, inanimate boundary material is this. I'll pass this one round. Maybe I'll show it on theirs before I do. Uh, can you see it's sort of like holy and foamy. So this is a piece of bioactive glass scaffolding. So this is designed to be implanted into the human body. And when it's in you, your body registers it as a food and it starts to grow new bone on it, like a scaffolding, but it also eats that scaffold, so it's both food and scaffold. And so over a period of time, you don't have an implant anymore. You just have your own bone. So it's designed to become you and to provoke you to heal yourself. So it sort of first got it a bit about five years ago and it was straight out of research labs. It's now being used in hospitals in, in London and it's, um, you can't grow great big bits at the moment so you couldn't sort of grow a femur back but it's great for sort of facial reconstruction, small joints, things that actually can give you huge quality of life if you are able to you know repair a damaged finger or something and, or replace the joints or um, build up a cheekbone again if you've had a terrible accident. And this stuff is enabling that. I mean, it's sort of gone from science fiction to reality. I'm sort of waiting for it to be kind of... The next phase will probably be something like the private medicine world will pick up on it and people will be doing kind of body modifications with it. You know, that sort of it feels like an inev inevitable direction for that kind of technology in one way. But um, it's, yeah, huge benefits to humankind, really. So, inanimate, inanimate, what next? I've got, let me think, all sorts of things I want to show. But um, as we're passing something round, I will just do a little bit on ceramics and then pass that round because I need it. Right, so this is a, a, a ceramic material called silicon nitride. So this is the second hardest stuff after diamond. So only diamond will scratch this, but it's... This exact object was given to me. I, had, um, I went to America to do a, a talk, and this guy came up to me afterwards, and he, he had one of those kind of like square haircuts, that, like, a, like a GI in a film or something, and his arms didn't really go down by side. You know if someone's too muscly for their own good and they can't put their arms down? So he was like sort of like this and like this, and he had this suit, and he had a suitcase with a handcuff on his wrist, 
and I hang, oh, and the other side of it was onto the suitcase. And he goes, you, Zari? And I'm like, yeah, he goes, come with me. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm, you know, they've, they've caught up with me, right? And it, he basically opened this box, this case, and inside there was sort of egg box foam with, like, ten of these guys arranged inside. And he's like, do you know what it is? And I'm thinking, I have absolutely no clue. I mean, and he's like, yeah, that's right, silicon nitride. And he goes, and I, thankfully, I did know what silicon nitride was, so I was, like, duly impressed. And then he said, do you want a bit? And I was like, do I? And he said, yeah, you can have one, but come with me. And he took me into this sort of sports hall. And um, uh, I remember there were some like, really handsome men doing like, training or something, like basketball players <laughs> or something. And, he, and um, they all had to stop as we walked into the middle of the sports hall. And he gave it to me and he said, yeah, throw it at the wall. And the wall was quite far away, so I was like, thank God I, my dad taught me how to play cricket. And I thought, right, I'm going to throw this ball. And I didn't really know what was going to happen, but basically lobbed it across the sports hall at a breeze block wall, and one breeze block just sort of exploded. And I was like, oh, sort of thrilled and terrified, like I'm going to get in terrible trouble, but I like, I like that kind of thing. I'm just looking for where I can throw this in the room. You can see what's happening, can't you? Um, and so, yeah, this is so hard that in a sort of one thing meeting another situation, the other is going to be the thing that gets damaged. Um, if we were on some wooden floor, for example, I just have to drop it like that and it will leave a dent in the wood, like a crater, because this has absolutely no elasticity. It will not give at all. So the wood has to do all the giving, but because it's not elastic, it won't recover and it leaves that crater with the ball behind. I don't know, if I think if I throw it at this, this is not, a, you know, this is nothing behind there, isn't there? <laughs> I don't know. The table, the table will just juggle. Yeah, there's a nice dent there. <laughs> it didn't break, that's good. Yeah, we'll, we'll take it out later out and, um, and leave a nice... Listed. You've got... It's listed. That bit's not listed. No, where is listed? <laughs> I'm feeling like a pillar, but that's quite a <laughs> narrow target. <laughs> Shall I? You don't... Oh, blimey, you're no fun. All right, later. <laughs> later. So that's one type of ceramic. This is super, super hard, right? But here's another. I mean, ceramics are very, very strong, but they're, they're brittle. And we know if I was to throw that at the wall, what would happen to the plate? So in here, I've got a really, very, very brittle ceramic that the poor little thing is just like barely alive anymore. But this is, this is a ceramic superconductor. Now, superconductors are a type of material which... Oh, I'll have to unpack this for a minute. I haven't set myself up the story right. <laughs> when electricity travels down wires, you lose a lot of the electricity because of the heat. And tra transporting electricity is difficult and inefficient. And that's why, like, the Sahara Desert is not just solar panels and the world plugs in. Is it you wouldn't get to us, you lose it. And, but they're a type of material called superconductors that electricity passes through without any resistance at all. And that, if we could manufacture superconducting wires, you would have no resistance and the whole world could run off, you know, solar panels in the desert. But that's not the case at the moment. But there are a few materials that they found do act as superconductors. But the only problem is they have to be cooled to minus 196 degrees Celsius in, um, in order to in order to superconduct. So, I'm going to show you some superconducting behaviours and using some liquid nitrogen. Oh, let me just clear the decks slightly. I need these. Oh. Okay, so this ceramic, at, this, at the moment, it, ceramics aren't magnetic, okay, so there's the plate. This is a little magnet. How can I prove it? Maybe pick up that spoon. So there's a small magnet here, which, um, yeah, doesn't interact with magnets. This ceramic here, the, the lines of magnetic field off this magnet are just passing straight through the object. But if I cool it down, that should change. Okay, hang on. I'm really bad multitasker. And I call multitasking like talking and doing at the same time, not even like doing more than one thing. But when it comes to something that I need to sort of focus, right? Now, this is really cold, this liquid. 
Um, and it looks like, if I just put a bit on the floor, <laughs> you'll be able to feel that cold air coming towards you. But this will take a while to cool down the ceramic, because the first thing it wants to do is just evaporate. But if I get this... So you'll see these little bubbles. This is essentially boiling now, because as far as this liquid's concerned, this, every surface it touches is like really, really hot. So this is like tipping water onto a 200 degrees Celsius oven. It's just that the water is 200 degrees cooler than the sur this surface. Right, so at the moment, it's bubbling away nicely in some liquid nitrogen. I'll leave it de 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 under there. don't want to knock it over. OK, so it's in the nitrogen. It's cooling down. Well, I just want to leave it for a minute to get... Oh, no, it's so fragile. Now, in, there's a kind of saying in science, if it works, it's physics. If it doesn't work, it's chemistry. Um, <laughs> But I think if, in this case, if it works, it's science. If it doesn't work, we'll just call it art, all right? But um, I might need a glamorous assistant. Martha, do you want to help? OK. Actually, maybe, maybe I don't. Hold on. Let me see. I, I might just be able to bend this. Oh, shit. Can you handle sort of looking at it slightly upside down -y? I'm trying to give you a profile view, because I'm going to put... Oh, my God. I'm going to put the magnet on top of it. And we'll, it should. Oh, hang on. Oh, oh, oh. It should. Now that that's superconducting levitation. That is. Oh, I've knocked it off, bugger. Oh, cold. Hold on. Bit more nitrogen. So that is. Essentially, the magnet, it's neither attracted nor repelled. It's not a magnetic behaviour. What's happening is that a sort of almost force field, essentially, is being created above the ceramic. And it's forming a kind of chubby air that it wants to just sit in. If I push down, it will stay there. There we go. And it's spinning because if I give it a little spin, it will just keep moving. And that will be perpetual motion, essentially. There's no friction there. So that will just keep spinning for as long as it remains cold enough. Does that make sense? I'm going to try... I wanted to do this, to pass it underneath to kind of prove no hands kind of thing. But that, um, that'll just stay there now, sort of upstaging me slowly. But that's superconducting levitation. And people are trying to make superconductors that work without having to make them so cold, because there's obviously an inefficiency there of having to keep keeping this thing cold. And they've managed to do it for, like, 0 0.000000 whatever, one of a second. They've managed to find a material that does it at room temperature, but it only does it for a moment. But um, it's kind of beautiful. Oh, you're in the... In the <laughs> Did you get a good photo of that? Yeah, okay, fine. I'll stop that. Right, we'll come back to the more liquid nitrogen in a minute. Let me put this back up there. Right. So then, now I've used the magnet for that purpose, I can show you the magnetic liquid. Some of you may have seen this sort of thing on YouTube. So here we've got a liquid which is um, kind of quite oily, and it's an oil which has got nanoscale iron filings inside it. So these are unimaginably tiny pieces of rust, basically, iron oxide, in this oil. But if you were just to tip some iron filings into some liquid and you put a magnet on it, you would pull away the metal and leave the liquid behind. But because these pieces of um, rust, this iron oxide is so small, they actually, it's more efficient for them just to move the whole liquid with it. So the whole liquid responds to the magnet and its viscosity, so its ability to flow, is directly affected by that magnetic field. And I'll pass it round, but you can sort of see maybe on the camera there's these... Maybe you can't, because I'm not holding it well. Can you see that sort of slight spikes on its surface? Yes. That's those lines of magnetic field coming off the magnet and sort of rendering physical into that liquid. But I will pass this around on the condition that you do not open this, all right? You're promising. Do not open it, and do not sort of hold the magnet here and then let go and let it fly towards the glass jar, because if this breaks or if this liquid gets out, it, one, it will make a terrible mess, but two, those particles of iron oxide are so unimaginably small, they will pass straight through your skin, in through your cell walls, and they may fiddle around with your DNA, all right? So, <laughs> just saying. I'm not, I can't guarantee that, you know, so be careful. But that's, they're, um, 
being used as a hydraulic fluid in like high-end cars and things where they wanted a situation where they have the suspension system and there'd be a, like a knob in the car where you want hard or soft suspension and what you're doing is applying or taking away an electromagnet from this liquid so you make it more stiff, more viscous or more fluid. Um, talking of fluid and stiff things... <laughs> Tinder? No. <laughs> Um, this, this is a, a material which some of you may have had as kids. It's called silly putty. Like, it would have come in an egg. I don't know why it came in an egg. But this is really nice because it's both a liquid and a solid simultaneously. This is a material which is described as a viscous elastic material. So it has the viscosity of liquids like it flows, but it has elasticity as well. So if I was just leaving this on the table, it forms a blob. In fact, I might have a slide. Yes, look at that, organised. So this is a big amount of silly putty um, that I've tipped over and I filmed with a time-lapse camera over a period of five hours. And that five hours has been condensed here to 20 seconds so that it looks like a liquid, like cake mix. You're like, so what? But if you walked in, you just don't see it moving. It's moving so imperceptibly slowly that you wouldn't know that it was flowing. But it does. But it's kind of energy respondent. So if you give it energy, it becomes more solid. Um, if I make this into a kind of ball shape... That, I'll just show you that by just bouncing it, it becomes elastic. And if I had a hammer, I could smash it and it would actually crack. Ooh. But you can pass that round. <laughs> something for the back, they haven't had something. It's a nice, good throw again. Good. Throwing skills are very important. I just get that out there. It's really a life skill. Um, catching also is good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's, that's a material perception of taking a large amount of time and condensing it down. But here we've got a short amount of time and we're speeding it up, um, sort of stretching it out. So this is like a fraction of a second. Um, for a while I became a bit of an expert in breaking gla uh, wine glasses with sound. So I built this kit and I did a few performances at, at Tate Modern that involved breaking stuff, basically. Um, and the sort of finale was a whole series of wine glasses that I smashed. Um, but the idea was that Essentially, damage is an incredible revealer of materiality. How something breaks will tell you a lot about what it's like. And what you can see from this, first off, is how elastic is glass. Like, the rim of that glass is moving a centimetre. Glass is really, really elastic. I've made a spring. You can make a spring out of glass, and it will bounce up and down. It's just also very brittle. So if you hit it in the wrong way, it's going to smash. Um, but then we found there was a kind of really nice relationship between the stem, the stiffness of the stem and the elasticity up at the rim and the cracks always moved up in that kind of vertical way. But I just wanted to say that that's like an instance of material life expanded out and so you perceive that material behaviour differently. Um, what else? What, what next? Which direction to go in? Where is she going to go? What is she going to break? Um, I wanted to show you... We were talking about... Actually, let's do this next then. Okay. So, what a mess... Liquids, I've just described a liquid that when you hit it, it becomes more solid. But there are, oh no, that's not, that's worse, that's terrible. There are liquids that when you give them energy, they become more liquid, okay? And uh, ketchup is one of them, because, you know, we've all been there, right? You're at, the, you're at the restaurant or you're at home and special occasion, you've got chips or whatever and you get the ketchup out. And, you, you know, you, you do the classic bash, 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 blur, and then there's too much ketchup and it's all over the place. Because you've just given that ketchup too much energy. The thing with ketchup is, like, I'm going to attempt a graph of some description. This is, like, energy, and this is time. You whacking the ketchup is, like, bang, 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 bang. Ketchup only needs about this much energy to become more liquid. It doesn't need all that. And what it, but what it needs is a kind of sustained injection of energy. So... You don't do this, you want a graph that's kind of this kind of shape. So how you do that is by giving it a small amount of energy and just vibrating that bottle really carefully, okay? So you want to kind of... I'm trying to build like a ketchup vibrator that just does the perfect... If you, so if you were to get the ketchup and just very gently, probably around the middle, so you evenly dissipate the energy, and I'm, if I'm hitting it too hard, I'm at risk of a big bit coming out. But I'm trying to get it just to flow... I don't know, I'm not going to be able to do it. It's not doing it. <laughs> See? You can't resist it. But the, this is the absolute trick, is just gentle vibration 
of the ketchup. And I promise you, oh, there we go. It will roll, it will run out really easily. So, I mean, so much so that you can sort of draw and it will be a really predictable strand. But I've got kind of overexcited. And I sh what I shouldn't have done was that shake I did at the start. But it's impossible to hold this object and not want to kind of do that, I find. Like, it's just, the minute you got it, you want to really go for it. But no, you've got to kind of go, we'll leave it, we'll come back to that later. You can have a try at the end because ketchup vibration technique, again, good life skill to, to perfect there. Right. This is time to maybe embarrass myself even more. But um, I was invited to give a talk at uh, Reba, and I'd, I have a bit of a thing for architects. It's like a well-known fact at UCL that, that the most handsome men are at the Bartlett. And, um, <laughs> And I thought, oh, God, Reba, it's going to be full of them. This is my chance to, like, really seduce them with my materials. And, uh, yeah, there'd be loads of them will come up to me at the end with their numbers. And then, like, don't show them your moustache, Zoe. Just don't show them your moustache. You, come on. Anyway, I thought, um, a few years back, someone said to me, have you heard of transparent concrete? And I was like, no, that's kind of sexy. What's, what's transparent concrete? And they showed me a picture, and it was not as sexy as they'd made out. But... Basically, it was concrete with pieces of glass or optical fibres laid inside. So really, you're seeing through the optical fibres, and they're embedded in the concrete. And I rang the company up, and I said, could you send me a sample of your transparent concrete? I'm like, no, no, never French. No, no, no. We don't, we don't give samples. I was like, oh, fine. And um, I was, they, they sort of slightly pissed me off. And so a kind of combination of sort of annoyance and jealousy and, like, desire to impress men drew me into this kind of like motivated me to then think bugger you I'm going to make my own and it's going to be really good it's going to be better than theirs so the first thing I did was like just make a small little prototype um here's just a cube of concrete and I've laid optical fibers into it but what they did was they just sort of scattered this optical fibers through wherever they could and made this sort of decorative panel but I thought they really missed a trick if you can develop a system of arranging these optical fibres as a grid, you'll actually be able to produce an analogue screen. So here is the, um, the cube and the optical fibres just coming through. But I'll just so you, you know, you get the colour, you know, light. It's the real light that you're seeing passing through with no loss of internal refraction. But essentially the implication of that is you've got resolution. So there's my finger through there. But then, so the, the pitch was for the, the handsome architect was like, let's build a house together, you know, let's, let's, <laughs> let's have a life, imagine the life, my family have a farm, I've got the land, you've always wanted to build your own house, let's do it, I've got this material, I want to use it. And so this is the, the next sort of phase, was to demonstrate that it can go around corners, because optical fibres, they're incredibly thin strands of glass, and light travels down them without any loss of internal without any internal refraction, and you don't lo lose any intensity of light. So I could have a bundle here, it goes all the way around the world and comes out the other side, and the light will have the same intensity. And in fact, that's the internet, basically, travelling down those optical fibres. But So this is the, um, the grid going around a corner. Did you, are you taking a photo? <laughs> no, copyright me. So anyway, but from that kind of like those strange motivating factors of kind of sex and envy. Um, I now have patent pending and working with a really large concrete company to take the system that I developed of how to put that in a grid and make it manageable into something that you could then implant into a building. So in kind of life, don't underestimate those kind of moments of like, because they can be really productive. Um, and lots of interesting things can come out of them. Um, I need to check the time because there's loads of things I'd like to talk about, but I've been given an hour and... Okay, I'm supposed to say are there any questions, but would you like me to show you one more thing or do you want to ask questions? Or two more things? Two more things. Two more things. Okay, has anybody got an iPhone that they feel like they're ready for an upgrade, they don't need any more? <laughs> really, you, you have ready for an upgrade? Because I promise that it may not come back to you in one piece. Okay, great. You can come up then as well. You can be part of this. Come on up. So we've looked at some sort of bio-cooperative materials, as I like to call them, but there's also biomimicry. This is where biological structures are mimicked in nature, and um, like Velcro is a really famous example of that. Like when they found the 
the burrs on the dog's arm and it's like hookiness and furriness, inverted Velcro. And so the latest sort of version of that is this stuff. This is gecko tape. This is a material which has, it has um, normal glue on one side, which is why I've made this and stuck it to there. But on the other side, just touch. it's not sticky, it's just sort of, it's not traditionally sticky. But this is an in, incredibly strong material. Um, it has millions of microscopic hairs on its surface. So this is a hairy surface that increases that surface area and then enables a sort of surface tension relationship. Yes, first, first thing done. Let's push this on a little bit more. Surface tension relationship with materials. So this is stuck to the glass um, of your phone. Now, this is your last chance. Are you sure? Fine. Oh, no, I might have ruined the gecko tape. You could be off the hook. I think you're off the hook because I've accidentally stripped it. Oh, no. You might, but that's worse, really, because I can't get that off there. You might have to take that home like this. <laughs> oh. Well, let's see. I think I've damaged this panel, but we'll, we'll try and put it on a bit that's less damaged. I don't know. The idea was that we were going to sandwich this together and do a kind of tug of war and pull your phone apart, but I've damaged this bit of gecko tape. So genuinely, now that's stuck on there. <laughs> I don't know how to suggest getting off other than come to me at the end. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Try. See if you can get off. Yeah. It, we, so the problem is, I've, at the Institute of Making, we have a crane, and um, I built a rig that this crane can pick me up holding, all it is is these two stuck on a piece of glass and it will lift me up. I mean, that's how strong that is, but it's a directional force, so it's strong if you pull directly like this. If you shear it like that, it will come off. So if you can, if you can get a bit under one end of the phone and flick it up, it will come off. If you just try and pull it, it won't. But if you just get a bit of a tool or something underneath it. I mean, that didn't work as a finale, did it? So I think I'll... <laughs> We'll come back to the liquid nitrogen as the last bit and sort of round it all off with another type of crystal production. Um, basically, ice cream, right, is all... The, the, the quality of an ice cream is obviously dependent on the ingredients, but it's also about the size of those ice crystals inside the ice cream. And if you're able to make very, very, very small crystals, the ice cream will be incredibly smooth. And so... The theory, you know, the, the theory and the practice goes that the best ice cream is that made incredibly fast, because the faster you freeze it, the smaller those crystals are. Um, so to make really fast ice cream, we can use liquid nitrogen. And I've got enough spoons. I was told to bring enough for 100, so there's probably enough for two each. Take a spoon, pass that round in preparation, and I'll get cooking. Do, do, do. We probably don't need two packs of raspberries. Do we want all cream or a bit of yogurt and a bit of cream? How are you feeling? Ice cream. Yeah, I know, I know, but yeah, you give a, you've got to have a, there might have been some sort of, okay, so some cream. And we've squished the raspberries in. Are there any questions? And I can talk and do this, because this is not too difficult. It's actually a, a silicon. It's cast, and they cast it onto this nano surface and then remove the silicon layer. So the, the amazing thing of the gecko is the metal casting plate that they pour the silicon onto, which has those microscopic hairs on. Raspberry. They're, now, experience has taught me that... Um, oh, yeah. That it needs a bit of extra sweetness. Like, raspberries on their own, it's not seasonal, this, is it? So they, they need a bit of a helping hand. So I'm just going to put a bit of honey in as well. Oh, who's got the spoons? Can I have a, sp a spoon? Just to, to taste. Thanks. It is very different. I mean, in some ways, for me, like product is a dirty word in some respects because I'm interested in everything, not just things that you could buy. So. If you're like 
where can I get three quarter inch aluminium with an anodized thing? Da -da -da -da. This is not the kind of library for you. But if you're like, oh, I'm really interested in stuff that's sort of smelly, this is more kind of our end of the spectrum. Um, and as a project, it really grew out of personal passion and the desire to kind of have stuff, really. <laughs> like, just being the sort of person who would be like, collect, you know, my mum would always say as a kid, I couldn't come home without stones in my pocket. And that physically engaging with the world around you, there's, there's certain information that you get through doing that with things. And so I, my type of work would often result in having a desk full of bits of material. And then I just felt like they were part of the story and I couldn't get rid of them. So you'd sort of keep this stuff. Um, and myself and uh, the other founder, Mark, both had these kinds of collections. So when we met, it was a question of like, oh, yeah, look what I've got. Yeah, look what I've got. And it was a kind of materials love at first sight, really, of like you've met somebody who you're on the same wavelength with. And so we founded the materials library as a place to make a home for this stuff but also as a place to gather other people who kind of understood it and were interested in the way that uh, a materials approach to the world. But then it kind of grew and grew, and we did like projects with the Tate and research papers and objects, and it became bigger than just a collection of things. So we founded the Institute of Making really as a way of saying, actually, these materials are in process. We want a workshop and the materials library, and they share a space. And that, that gives us an umbrella to say, yes, we're doing our own research. We do events, we do exhibitions, we make objects, we collect materials, we run a workshop. And these are all things that the Institute of Making gets up to. And so my role really as a director of that is to just sort of enable great stuff to happen and give permission for, you know, we always say in the induction, we're here to say yes. Like fundamentally, you can pretty much do anything with us. And if it is a bit dangerous, then we just look for the right way to make that, you know, mitigate against it. Our only sort of thing is like, don't be an arsehole and no weapons. That's our only real rule. Because I have had a visit from counter-terrorism and I'm, you know, I'm happy not to have that happen again. So we have some rules. What do I do with the nitrogen? Um, and, that, and that's about it, really. Um, so, so it's a kind of space where anything goes and any discipline or anyone who's interested in materials should feel welcome to kind of experiment. Um, I'm now I'm going to call on you, Arthur, as the glamorous assistant. Can anyone see the safety specs? Oh, they're here. You're not going to have any of these, I'm afraid, but that's, you don't really need them. <laughs> You'll need that. And I'm just trying to think through the logistics. Let's clear this table because I don't want to damage the AA's copy stand. Um, all right. If you come around here, you're going to be you're, you're in charge of pouring, all right? It's not going to harm you, is it? No, don't stand on my computer. Hang on, let's put that down there. All right. Oh, no, this is so unesthetic. I have to go back to the black. It's horrible, isn't it? You don't want that. No. That's better. OK. So if you, um, you're going to pour, and I'm going to, like, vigorously stir. But if I say stop... Which hand is for what? Uh, I mean, the protection is for... To be honest, I don't think you need... I think I need both of those. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, I don't. I'm, I'm in. I'm in the flow. You're just like. All right. Okay. So if I say stop, just stop. And, key or? No, just to, you know, just okay. start it off. Okay. Bit more. Keep going. Keep going. Bit, come, on, come on. Lovely. Okay. Stop. Right. Now I'm vigorously mixing to essentially distribute that liquid nitrogen through the mixture, but I mean, you can already hear it starts. Oh, it's cold on my crutch. Watch out. <laughs> Luckily, I've got ginormous trousers on, so it's quite far away from actually me. But OK, a bit more, just for the fun of it. But you can hear already that it's turning to ice. But you need to shake it. No, no, just pour it on this time. I think I've got the... I want to like a crust on the top. Go on. Like a mayonnaise. Like a mayonnaise. Done. All right, you can sit down again. Thank you. Right. I think we're pretty much ready. So, who wants some ice cream? Thanks very much. Let's get. <laughs> Come on. Tuck in. I've tried not to make. I've, yeah. If it smokes when it's on your spoon, it's too cold to eat. <laughs> but I don't think it will. Oh no. What on the floor? 
So fantastic. And um, perhaps you could take some while we're eating the ice cream, which is always a really cool way to end, <laughs> no pun intended, a uh, lecture. Um, if anyone's got any, any questions. We can pass it round if you only hold the rim. Don't put your hand underneath. If you hold the rim, we can pass it, pass it, pass it along and round so you can eat and... <laughs> it could have been a bit sweeter, I think. I don't know. It's tart-ish. It's all right. I wondered, um, just to kick off, maybe with a, a question about... Because um, I, 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 I know you kind of look with disdain at a lot of material libraries. Sorry? You've the disdain. Disdain. Uh, kind of the, you, you said, you know, if it's a product, you know, we, we have these little swatches of things and we go and we look at them. Um, I remember reading something about you talking about aluminium yeah, the squares, sh the shininess, and that actually it's, it's really different at, you know, something this big than something the size of a, yeah. a building. I wondered if, um, where does the digital, where does kind of a kind of digital understanding of materials come into that? Now we have a lot of... Um, software that can start to supposedly yeah. tell us what materials are doing etc so i guess first off i would the swatches are interesting objects but i describe that there's a kind of tyranny of the swatch that the swatch is almost like this fetishized thing and it's all kind of sexy and it's on a chain and it's like every color perspex you could want and that's kind of alluring but at the same time it's incredibly limiting and making these objects was done purposefully as a kind of commentary on swatchness like this has something of the rules of swatch, like keep the shape the same and change the material, but the minute you introduce like an object status that has a functionality, you're actually demonstrating the limitations of other types of swatches. Like you can reveal all sorts of things that way, um, but then when you get onto kind of digitized materials databases, I think they're interesting because they serve, they're very good at numbers, and if numbers are what you're interested in finding out, then that's how you can do it, but making numbers meaningful is a different thing. So like here we've got, um, a piece of alum, a cube of aluminium and a, a cube of tungsten. Um, I'm going to pick on you again. I'm going to do your house then. <laughs> <laughs> Are you marrying me? No. <laughs> um, pick that up. Well, that was embarrassing, wasn't it? They didn't laugh. Oh. <laughs> pick, no, no, you pick that one up, then pick that one up. Oh, wow. Yeah, so pass those two round, but there's a game here. Hold on, hold on, hold on. The game is pass them to the per your partner like this, and then pick the aluminium one up, then pick the, with one, so it's, I'll show you how to play, you go like that, then you go like that, because then you get a direct muscle memory comparison of the density of these two materials on the palms of the hand, so then pass it to your neighbour by them being able to do that, I've made it much more complicated than it needs to be, but you essentially then get a direct comparison of those two materials, but you, I could tell you, the, pardon? Yeah, so that's tungsten and aluminium, and you could, I could tell you the number, you can look that up, but it's not until you physically feel it that you know, my God, that really is heavy. And what you're really experiencing there is how heavy those atoms are. You have atomic mass, that's the difference between those two materials. One has heavier atoms than the other. It also has more of them in the thing, but each atom is fundamentally a heavier thing, so much so that you get a physical experience of it. But so render, I mean, making that meaningful in a digital way is a different thing. And I guess what I'm interested in is real physical stuff in a real physical space. And we have an app. If anyone wants to download it, it's free. You can download our materials library app. And it gives you stories and information, but it's not a replacement of that experience. Um, I find it interesting the kind of rendering that happens in the material world. Like there's now, I've sort of observed in the last 10 or 15 years, a kind of switch in the materials manufacturers of being able to make facade materials that look like digital rendering. It, because then it looks much more like it did when the in the architectural model. Like, there's a kind of coming together of trying to make a rendered palette of options look quite like the real thing, but there was also a movement in the production of the real things in the factories to say, well, we can make it look a bit more like that if you want. And then designing the material to fit the digital idea of it, which I think is kind of interesting. Like you can look at, oh, that's a, yeah, that's a rhino building, whatever, and that's a kind of, it's got a bit of that material, it's got that swatch option on it, and the company who best made that swatch option is kind of them, and it's, it's, it's interesting. Is this me making this terrible noise? No. Um, yeah. Oh. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> 
So, you, um, you can buy it, but you need to be certified to handle it. So, BOC, oh God, um, BOC are the kind of gas company who deliver all sorts of different liquids and gases around the country. And if you go through their checklist and they send someone out to look at your premises and understand where you're going to store it, they will supply you. But to do that, you need a secure handling space, often a cage, to lock the liquid in, to store it in. Um, the correct handling objects and safety kit. So BOC, but um, you couldn't just go online and have a bit. <laughs> Any other questions? There's a place in Camden that uh, this ice cream thing is actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? Emmanuel, yeah. Uh, I, I guess m material science is kind of exploding incredibly rapidly and and I assume there's, there's a, from your position, probably always a hunt for the, for the new kind of mm. material. Which one would be uh, number one on your hit list right now? And, or, or the one that was harder to get to, or the one that you're really trying to get your hands on? Yeah, I mean, I'd, if pushed, I'd quite like a gold bar, really. Which is not, it's neither new or wondrous, but it's, it's a sort of archetype of the, our relationship to materials and the, how we quantify them and give them a kind of meaning and base societies on them. So I'd really like a gold bar, but I've looked into it and the insurance alone to keep one on site so you see <laughs> it's quite high. And I, yeah, so maybe a gold bar, but then um, I, we've got quite a few different types of aerogels, but I'd really like some of the new sort of flexible aerogels and ones that you can saw and smash. And I saw today this guy with, um, he's developed this mushroom fungus into this extraordinary building material that can take all sorts of impact, can be m molded in kind of crazy ways. I tweeted about it earlier, if anyone wants to look at the video, it's on there. But um, there's always something, and, and it's kind of interesting, there's a kind of world of the superlative material, like the blackest black, the shiniest aluminium, the lightest light thing, and it's this perpetual hunt for the, the, the edge of where we've got to, and when you get to that bit, it's going to be extraordinary. But then, actually, someone else surpasses you, and it's not quite so extraordinary anymore. And I find that a kind of interesting <coughs> phenomenon, but sometimes the results themselves aren't necessarily as interesting. And things like smart materials, if someone starts talking to me, I feel nauseous when they start talking about that, because, like... I think all materials are smart. It's just you haven't asked the right question of them if you don't understand what's so smart about chocolate. You know, like, it's a question of your interrogation of them and your ability to, you know, draw out the best of them that will demonstrate their wondrousness, not, you know, does it jump or something. Like, there, you know, there's as much material science in chocolate as there is in aluminium. And that's an incredible material that we have designed to do something amazing, which is melt in our mouth and make us go, mmm. And make you go, mmm, is not, you know, is extraordinary. And that's incredibly wondrous, and yet yeah, every day. And I said, I can go into all the science of chocolate if you're interested, but um, I'm, you, you really want to know. <laughs> can you explain a bit uh, your research about the psychologi psychological effects uh, of materials on people, that kind of psychophysics? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, psychophysics is... It makes I always want to go, ha, 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 like, it's like that. Anyway, um, so psychophysics, ha, 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 is, <laughs> is um, a, essentially a brand of physics that was developed in collaboration with psychologists to try and get a handle on measuring the impossible, essentially. Measuring things which are to do with our perception of the world, not something abstract, like, um, you know, the wavelength of light. They want to look at things that you can't really measure, like softness, like how do you really define those things? And we're interested in that because that's fundamentally part of our materials expertise. If I had a range of stuff and said, pick out the softness, we all know what we mean and we could all, you know, we're incredibly sophisticated materials interrogators with our eyes, our nose, our hands, our teeth, our, the acoustics. We kind of can understand what we mean and agree on things, but actually to measure it and create then later those databases with those numbers is harder. So we've developed something which we've called the sensor aesthetics of materials. So this is our label for trying to look at aesthetics as a broader sensory experience of the world, not just a visual one. And that 
developing a sense of aesthetic language and mode of interrogation gives you a way of actually hopefully being able to manipulate those what become sensations. So the easiest way to describe that is to talk a little bit about the Spoons project. So this was really um, my quest to make the best spoon in the world. Like that's the bottom line, is I want to make the, the best spoon ever. But first off, like what's it going to be made out of? So you look in the literature, what, you know, what's the taste of metals? And nobody's done it. Like no, the only research I found was about people taking like copper salt solutions and they put it in water, they get people to swill it around their mouths, spit out and go, mm, yeah, copper, a bit salty or something. But they're not even, I'm like, why didn't they just lick a bit of copper? I mean, it was so sort of abstracted from the thing because they needed to quantify it. They needed to know how many grams of copper were you having an experience of because otherwise it wasn't a real scientific experiment. But actually, then I was thinking, well, I developed a method of this, which is my perverted swatch. If I start making objects, actually, we could use those as interrogation objects. So made spoons of different materials, conducted research and experiments using human subjects, full ethical approval, psychologists on board. Basically, it came down to blindfolding people and saying, suck that. I mean, it's, that's, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot much more to it. But to do that, you, know, you have to make sure you're not some sort of, like, pervert or something. So, um, and you, 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 the experiment is people are blindfolded, they suck on a spoon, and they say, and you ask them to rate it, and you say, between one and seven, how bitter is that? And then they go, mm, mm, five, quite bitter. And, and you know, you're gathering all this data of like hundreds of people. And then what you're first looking for is, are there any agreements? Is it, do most people go, ugh, disgusting, with tin or something? Like, that's the first bottom line, is there any agreement? And we found there was. Like, there's a really strong correlation that basically everybody found copper really bitter, zinc quite bitter, and metallic. So there's strong bitterness and metallic flavours. Um, nothing was really deemed sweet other than the gold was a little bit sweet um, and essentially there were agreements but then we took that perception data and we mapped it against like hardcore materials data like the more quantifiable measurable stuff so something called reduction potential which is how easy are electrons lost or gained so how reactive is something in certain environments um, and we mapped the two together and again they found there was an agreement things with high or low reduction potential mapped on with things or strong or uh, strong metallic tastes or low metallic tastes. And so that means you could start to then design and understand our experience of the taste of a material. But it's incredibly complex. Like taste is about texture also and smell and shape comes into play. So that's just investigating one thing, which is the material. But after that, I um, worked with a mission star chef to use the spoons in the restaurant and we devised a whole meal that played on the taste of each of them and how they paired with food. And then the next round of experiments wasn't just suck on the spoon. It was like, suck on, dip that spoon into that salty yoghurt and then suck on it. Ugh, yeah, really disgusting. Like, it was trying to introduce different flavoured creams with the spoons and understand how it affects taste. So we found that although the copper spoon is very bitter, if you eat something sweet off the copper spoon, you perceive it sweeter than it really is because it's in contrast to the bitterness of the spoon. So then you get into the implications of actually you could design a can that you might drink from with a little copper lip and you could lower the sugar content of the drink because you have that bitterness of the can that will then make the drink taste taste uh, sweeter. Um, but I also just finished working on, um, I can't name it because it's being recorded, but a big airline, think of one and you've probably thought of it, um, <laughs> where I was redesigning the cutlery and the tableware for the plane taking into account material and perception and how those things change and how you could engineer a better eating experience, basically. But I guess psychophysics is essentially an attempt to get a handle on those more perceptual parts of our experience of the world. Um, so we're interested in that and doing ongoing research about texture and smell and all sorts. And there, there are no scales at the moment for that, because I, I I've seen a um, shampoo advert that said... Um, 75% more luxuriant and wondered what that meant. Yeah. Or Andrex must have a softness. The softer, long, yeah. Softness. I mean, there's no, there's no universal index of softness or, um, and it would be interesting to tr attempt one and there's a whole, there's a place uh, near Milton Keynesway, I can't remember what it's called. Oh, it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's full of 
it's all about the art of measuring, really. They, you know, it's where our kilogram, there's one kilogram in France, but anyway, our one's kept there, and it's this measurement institute. And they're trying to do some of this work and look at shininess and that kind of thing. So it's like a universal measure of one, these more quantifiable things. But the L'Oreal advert would just be, we conducted some experiments with some hair, then we washed it in that, and then people said, yeah, it's better. But it was probably, yeah, who knows how they got that number. Thank you very much. That was really eye-opening, I think. <laughs> um, I, you answered the question, one of the questions already, but then the other one I was kind of thinking, so uh, what are you? Or, you know, do you have any, <laughs> do, do, you have any, do you have any peers? Or, or, you know, you're sort of between Q and Heston Blumenthal, but actually you're more like a doctor, and then, but the doctor might, has to have an oath of, you know, sort of the mission. Paul Daniels? He could be, no. <laughs> but, you know, but the, the question goes more seriously. So, I mean, what, you, you presented everything very sort of um, playful and it was quite, uh, you know, easy accessible. But there's, I think, a very serious side to this. Um, and I think what would, you know, if you were a doctor, you would disagree with a lot of other medicines. So, in what sense, what really annoys you of how people use materials, or where do you think we got it completely wrong? Um, and I think, you know, I think in a way we can appreciate it as architects, but we are probably actually the completely wrong users because then we kind of end up with trying to use that stuff and build horrible buildings or quite terrible buildings, although we, you know, that's what we do, obviously. But I mean, is there something where you feel, oh my God, this is, you know, let's really not go there, that the world's got it wrong? Um, it's very difficult because everything is so incredibly complex. That's the kind of bottom line. Like, to, you can't even simplify a problem because it's so complex. So something like plastics, for example, it's very easy to talk about a sort of abuse of that material and that it's gone from being this extraordinary, wondrous future stuff of the 50s to then being an insult. Like, oh, it's sort of plastic, therefore it's cheap and it's disposable and it's sort of not very nice. Um, but actually, it's incredible stuff that we really need for certain properties of it, but maybe we don't really need for other things. And it's just convenient and cheap, and the indexes of what makes something valued or not valued. I mean, in one way, it's obscene that we throw that away, because that could last 100 years. Um, so it's, it's not to say about systems of recycling, it's about systems of product, material, functionality, and all of those things. Like, um, I often think if I was sort of had an eye on some sort of legacy and enough money, I'd be like buying landfill sites because I think in 200 years they're the extraordinary materials resource. And I go to all these conferences where they might be like, you know, government ministers galore having very, very serious conversations about material security. Like, what do we do if, you know, country X no longer is going to be prepared to sell? material why we're buggered because then we can't have MRI machines or something like that. Like there are certain objects and uh, that we've developed in our society, certain technologies that really rely on the certain functionality of certain materials that are in a way either rare in that there isn't much of it or rare in terms of it's controlled in a certain way. And it's so complex, the story of what, you know, what goes into an object like this and so sophisticated and extraordinary, but also kind of mad that we we know that in two years we'll get another one um, and that we're sort of designing, not designing end of life of things very well at the moment. Like it's that whole, I might say cradle to cradle, but it's that sense of understanding what I was saying earlier about materials and objects. In some ways there's no such thing. They're all material objects in a constant state of process and that this might exist for a million years like this, then have a life as this, but when it's this, this is in a constant battle to oxidise. Its surface is gaining oxygen, you know, left, right and centre. It's going to turn green because it wants to go back to being that. And, but it's just having a life as a spoon for a bit, and it, but it's on a process. And all of our objects are in process. Um, you know, the big floating, beautiful in many ways, and horrendous in other ways, plastic island in, I can't remember which sea it is, is... You know, what happens if that sinks and then land goes onto it and it becomes part of our geology? Like, what, that could be an interesting material process, so invent a new material that we'd never thought about. But I guess, from my point of view, it's about trying to think 
in different timescales about all sorts of things. Um, and I think sometimes we th think in very short timescales, and that makes us make certain material decisions. Do you think then, because we've developed a Yeah, but it isn't so easy because what happens is people say plastics are wrong. Yeah. That's not necessarily true. Like it, and I really hate terms like smart materials. I also hate natural materials because everything's natural. Like, you know, that was a tree that then fell down, that became coal, that then became oil, that then became, you know, it's not natural is, is a perception and it's a judgment, I think. So you can have incredibly harmful natural products if you want to take them as in a, something in its raw state, like you know, radium or something. You know, mine uranium naturally, but it's not good for you. Like, uh, I mean, so it's not so easy to say one material is the answer or yes or no to things. You only have to look at the attempt at recycling and you suddenly realise, oh, I thought plastic was plastic, and now there's like six symbols. And why can't I recycle that and I can that? Like, it's just so difficult to help people perceive the complexity of it that I think it has to come further up in terms of the design and then sort of system implementation. So now I think it's interesting the work around looking at the city as its own material and that we generate certain types of waste but that's also potential. Um, but all those terms are so loaded. The minute you say waste it's, it's either worthy, you're doing something worthy or you're accusing. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's very difficult for it to be like, yeah, waste, I love waste. Waste is just brilliant, because waste, duh, duh. like that's, that doesn't happen so much. Um, oh, I keep standing on that plate. Any other question? No, has all the ice cream gone? I could make some more, there's actually, there's plenty of, which I just see you all out with a big cloud of liquid nitrogen. Yeah. Can you speak about the chocolates? Can I speak about the chocolates? Sure. I mean, if you have to go, feel free, but I'm going to now talk about chocolate. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can put it on the camera. Have you ever opened a chocolate bar and it's been a bit like this? Or if you're like me, like, I have a sister, and I remember as a kid, you'd, Easter would come around, and you'd get all this chocolate. You'd never, no one, it wasn't really allowed a lot of chocolate. And then suddenly Easter, and there was a kind of cachet in having, trying to eke that chocolate out as long as possible, and a kind of competition with my sister to suddenly reveal an Easter egg come July or something and be like, ah, ha, ha, chocolate. Like, so that, was our, that was our supply and you had to kind of decide how you're going to manage that supply of, that limited supply of chocolate in your life. But anyway, you open your Easter egg in July and it's like that. It's sort of, you think, oh my God, it's gone mouldy. And then your sister like tr is triumphant that she ate hers earlier. So that sort of, what looks like a mould is actually a phenomenon that's called fat bloom. So when, um, chocolate goes from liquids to solids, so the solidification of chocolate, the controlling of that is all about, like with the metals, the controlling of the growth of crystals within that structure. So there's sugar crystals and also fat globules, and co so cocoa butters and cocoa solids and cocoa powders and fats which, and sugars, which to keep them evenly distributed and solidify in a unified way so no one thing takes over from the other is the kind of art of making the chocolate bar. And the ratios of those ingredients um, and the, the speed at which you solidify it, so how quickly you cool it, are all important. Um, but if that process happens in an uncontrolled way, the ingredients start to split and group up and you get this. So this is chocolate where it's, it's melted in the sun a bit or it's got a bit warm, it's softened, the ingredients have split from each other and it's re-solidified in an uncontrolled way. And the fat has come, risen to the surface of the ingredients. So that's not mould, it's just the fat that was in there anyway and forming what's called fat bloom on the surface. And it's, it's the same stuff, it's the same ratios of ingredients, but actually it's become a different material. It's organised itself in a different way to make it a different stuff. And you know, the rate of dissolving, and I spoke before about the mmm factor, the size of those crystals make a difference on that. So Galaxy has really much smaller crystals than Yorkie. So I mean, you can sort of feel one is grainier and one sort of trades on its ability to just sort of become smoother. And those like little lint balls that are practically liquid already, that's all around those crystal structures and the ratios of the ingredients and so the temperatures at which they melt by. 
and controlling that is a science. I mean, if you're Cadbury's and you're making a dairy milk bar for the UK and one for Australia, you actually have to make them differently because they're going to exist in different environments. The Australian one needs to exist and still be a chocolate bar in a shop that's going to have a higher ambient temperature. So it's m more risk of fat blooming. So they change the ingredients and they make it. It really is a different thing, their dairy milk from ours. And again, it's no coincidence that those kind of northern European countries that have a cool temperate climate actually produce great chocolate because we've got an environment where the material can exist. You know, it's, it's not so common in the south of Italy that you'll see chocolate production. And um, yeah, so I think you should all have some chocolate tomorrow and feel like I'm investigating the material science of this. And, <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Go on, you know you want to. You want the nitrogen on the floor, don't you? Okay. All right. Are you going back in your chair? That's all right. I won't put it on there. I'm going to shoot it down the aisle. Um, you're going <laughs> to... All right? Okay. A bit more. There we go. It's been quite hot. On that note... <laughs>